Welcome to The Agronomist, everybody. It is uh, your host, Sean Haney, and we are in prime time tonight. It is Monday. Forget about football or the U.S. election happening tomorrow. We're talking agronomy here tonight. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, a very important topic, to be honest with you. We're talking soil compaction. Now, we've got two great guests, two great panelists, and we're going to also watch some clips of some of the footage in the Real Agriculture Library as well tonight, which is uh, going to provide even more insight on top of the panel's discussion. Uh, if you want to participate in tonight's uh, commentary and get your question asked with our experts, all you have to do is enter it in the comment box, whether you're watching on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or Twitch. Just type it in, hit enter, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. So please participate. That's the beauty of all of these live streams is you get a chance to participate. So I encourage you to do so. Okay, let's bring in tonight's guests. And first up, it is Marla Rickman. She's with Manitoba Agriculture. Marla, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks. How are you, Sean? I'm doing great. How, is the is it pretty warm in Manitoba this week? Or are we getting that last little bit of fall work done? Or what's going on? It's attempting to, but you know, I haven't left these four walls in so many days. I don't even know what the weather's like outside anymore. <laughs> And, and also, we've got uh, Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson, who put on a sport coat. Uh, Pete, oh. this is this is interesting. We're in prime time. You got to dress up for the affair. I, I didn't get the memo. How, you look sharp tonight, buddy. Hey, absolutely. Anything for you, Sean. I I was at, did a, a spiel with the UK uh, yesterday, I think, or the day, whatever. Uh, one day on on uh, pesticide registration in Canada. So it's kind of fun yeah. and. Those people are very uh, prim and proper, and so a jacket was appropriate. And I thought, ah, oh, sugar, we're in prime time, man. I should be, you know, look, looking my best just for for Sean Haney for a change. By the way, I am incredibly stinking jealous of your temperature right now, Sean. I woke up this morning. We had seven centimeters, three inches of stupid snow. What? And howling winds, and it's like, ah, oh, frickin' Heimer. This is Ontario. <laughs> Should not supposed to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, yeah. It's like I think it's like sixteen degrees today, but the wind blew. It was not all perfect, Pete. Uh, I, I also, Pete. You know, if you're giving a presentation in the UK, the proper term is you put on your smart clothes. That's that's oh. yeah. You well, that would be hard for me, man. That would just be hard for me. I don't think the clothes will make me any smarter. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Let's let's get to tonight's topic. You know, I think it's no matter where you're farming. You know, if you're out in BC on the coast and you're running a dairy farm, or you are all the way in the Maritimes and everywhere in between, you deal with soil compaction. One one of the challenges, Marla, though, is that. It's it's really hard to come up with solutions, even if you kind of do figure out I have a problem. Absolutely. And that becomes one of I often say when I give extension presentations and stuff talking about uh, compaction, I say, you know, what, this is the thing that I hate talking about to farmers the most because there are no simple solutions. Everything to help solve it is more complex and you know broader thinking and, and just really, really difficult. I expect to have tomatoes thrown at me when I'm on stage, when I'm talking compaction. I expect people to be really pissed off at me at the end of it, but whatever, we got to talk about it. So that's, the, that's our reality. So what do people get mad about? What, like what, 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 are some of the, what are some of the trigger points? Well, you know, it's the fact that the only way that you can truly stop compaction from happening is to not get on the field in the first place. And nobody wants to talk about that. Um, and that's not a good solution. It's not a good way to kind of look at the situation and try to kind of work forward with some other kind of concepts, I guess. But I, you know, I just, I, I wish it was easier. I wish it was simpler, but mother nature throws a wrench at us regularly. And when we have those moist soils, we are just at higher risk of compaction and we compact the soil potentially all season long. So yeah. every time we're out there, we're causing problems potentially. Pete, I know this is a topic that you are uber passionate about and uh, the yield loss that potentially comes with it is, uh, is, it shows up at the end of the day when you look at your income statement. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's like Marla's talking about people whipping tomatoes at her. It's, it's because compaction is really insidious. You, you don't, you don't think that you're doing any damage. You don't see it until 
you dig up the root system or you're, you have fly the drone and you see the strips in the field. So it, it's really tough to, to get your brain around, but it has such an impact. And I actually think we're starting to get some really good s solutions. I think we're making tremendous progress, but those solutions cost money and mm -hmm. dang it, people always say, well, there's no payback, but there is payback. We just have to get our brains there around how that payback works. So I'm, I'm passionate about this because third time in my career, Sean, that this has come around. I've talked compaction. <laughs> I'm way too old. Uh, you know, things cycle. Third time in my career, first time out of those three times where I actually have good solutions other than Marla's stay out of the field when it's wet. Mm -hmm. And that to me is really exciting. Yeah. And Marla, we're going to watch a clip here that uh, you did uh, with realagriculture.com. And right off the top, you, you say that the, the only way to really 100% prevent compaction is to stay off your field. Well, that's really not a solution. That is not a solution at all for the, any of our audience. No, no, exactly. And Pete, you're kind of like making me panic a little bit about the future of my career. I've been talking compaction and for the last 10 years, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe it'll go away for a while, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I, I think you still have a, a long and, and illustrious career ahead of you, Marla, because <laughs> we have to convince a lot of people and it takes a lot of technology to get there. But but there, yeah, it's cool Absolutely. to actually yeah. have some better solutions. Okay, let's watch Absolutely. our first let, let, let's watch our first clip. Okay. Uh, it is, like I mentioned, it is with Marla and it's out in a field. Uh, there's some canola behind her. So uh, let's take a look and then we can discuss the clip. Here we go. It is right here. So today we're actually talking about soil compaction. And this is something that we've been talking about a lot lately. I always say that this is one of the hardest topics for me to discuss with farmers because there is no simple solution. And the actual easiest solution is to stay off the field, which is not an appropriate thing to say. Um, so, uh, so basically what we wanted to do is focus in on a little bit in this demo is looking at canola specifically, but compaction is something that affects all crops and almost all farmers, depending on what the field conditions are like at the time. Well, so the first thing with soil compaction that people need to understand is that um, when you have moist soils, when we're there near field capacity, that is when you're at your highest risk of compaction. So what happens is all of the big pores that you have are filled with air and the tiny little pores um, between the soil spaces are filled with water. So the water filled pores can't go anywhere. They don't squish down, but the big pores with air, they squish and compact. And when you take those big pores out, you restrict the ability for roots to grow through them. You restrict, once you restrict roots, you don't have those fine root hairs that are growing effectively in them. You start to affect some of the larger microorganisms that are trying to move through those soils. And so by doing so, it basically can start decreasing yield or affecting the, the crop negatively. What, what sort of tips do you have for farmers then? You know, you said, you can't stay out of the field but then what do you what do you do so so we need to think about being a bit more deliberate when we go into the field when we know we're at high risk so if it's dry and you're at low risk of compaction we don't really have to think about it but if we are dealing with high risk situations moist soils in the spring when we're trying to seed or in the fall when we've had these wet falls when we're trying to harvest even when we're trying to spray in the middle of summer if we have these wet soils we need to think about what can i do to decrease that risk so one of the things that you might do is to travel less across the field. So if your issue is you're going across the field and um, we use this line that we say 80% of compaction happens in the first pass. So if you were going over the uh, over a field four times in a row and you considered after that fourth time that to be 100% of total compaction, 80% happened the very first time you went across it. So if that's happening, if we're just driving randomly over a field, then that's not necessarily a good situation. So maybe we want to start being a bit more deliberate on how we travel. So if we know we're trying to get across a field, maybe for most of the time, if we can stay in the same track, then we're compacting it heavily, you know, more heavily, but at least not as bad as if we just randomly were driving across. So a good example would be something like going out with a grain cart. And if you're heading out to meet with the combine, uh, if you're just, you know, driving randomly across the field, that's going to show up and yield the next year. And you can quite often see this through aerial photographs, these random lines of light green where, where the wheel tracks are and the crop isn't doing as well. So 
we want to think about where we travel, how often we travel across the same spot, um, how often we just randomly travel across the field. We want to do things like make sure that our tire pressure is appropriate for field conditions. So if you're going out with your uh, tractor, you want to make sure that your tire pressure isn't too overinflated. You want um, appropriate uh, tire pressure. So talk to your tire people, make sure that you've got it run at the rated pressure and that will decrease the overall impact. Uh, use tracks if they're available to you, if you have tracks. If you've got tracks versus duels, there's not a real difference. As long as your tires are at their proper inflated pressure, then there's not really an advantage of tracks in terms of compaction. There may be other advantages that you're looking at, but the compaction will be about the same. Um, and then really we need to think about the weight of equipment that we travel across the field. So. We used to travel across the field with a grain truck and skinny little tires and then we moved to grain carts because we figured that that would be more appropriate and it is to a point but the grain carts got bigger and bigger and bigger and they get heavier and heavier and heavier as that happens and when we drive soil compaction deeper so axle load the heavier the equipment gets the deeper the soil kind of experiences the compaction that can be driven three to four feet into the ground there's not a whole lot we can do about that and so we need to go across maybe with lighter soil or lighter equipment if we can. So some people I suggest, you know, if it's a high risk situation, going across with a grain cart half full might be more appropriate. Not a lot of people want to hear that, but there have been some people who've started doing that or even running their combines, emptying them out when the hopper's half full, just to decrease some of that overall weight of the equipment on the field. Again, when the compaction is at its highest risk. That video was taken at Acropsapalooza, I believe, and uh, thanks to Kara Oosterhouse of mm -hmm. realagriculture.com for that footage that she took. Uh, for It was actually a canola school episode that she shot. Okay, so w what caught my attention there was this idea that 80% of the compaction happens on that first pass. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think there's a lot of growers out there that are like, okay, yeah, we don't have compaction issues because we're, we're driving in different spots all the time. We're not always driving at the end of the field. Quite frankly, I grew up on a farm where that was the attitude. Boy, were we wrong. Is this, is this a common mistake that people are making, Marla? Yeah, and I mean, when so people often say, like, what do you even mean by 80%? And so when you look into it, they had done studies where they went those four passes. And um, and when they looked at that total compaction, the first pass caused 80% of that total compaction after four passes. So that really does speak to the fact that there is a higher risk of causing that compaction with one pass. Like we do need, did I say deliberate enough in that video? I don't know, I kept hearing myself say deliberate. It's weird when you get to watch the words that you keep repeating, but, um, but really it is about being a bit more deliberate, planning um, and having those discussions with the operators on your farm, especially during harvest. So my dad, he's been uh, driving a grain cut a grain cart for a neighboring farmer in his retirement years and and like you know always says oh yeah you know he, he likes me i'm pretty good at it he really like i said dad do you want to really impress him bring up compaction with him and come up with a plan like you bring it up and talk about what you are thinking you could do to decrease compaction in the fall and then he's really gonna love you yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it is really about thinking about planning and trying to be proactive, really, in managing compaction. And that's the thing that people get frustrated with, is that we're busy. We have other things to think about. Nobody wants to be proactive thinking about compaction. This is the trade-off, Pete. Uh, you know, if we were on the Real Ag Radio show, I would say, I'm going to get, I'd save your emails. I, I get it. There's a trade-off here, efficiency versus some of the long-term damage that you're doing. Pete, how, how do you see growers managing that? Yeah, and so it's really interesting that Marla brought up tracks and, and grain carts because, man, growers here, that I have a grower who went to tracks on his, on his grain cart because he knew he was causing compaction with his tires. But when he did that, he went from a 1500 bushel grain buggy to a 2000 bushel grain buggy. Well, man, the tracks are going to help, but you can't solve deep compaction when 2000 bushels in a grain buggy, the size of this equipment. So, so how do you work at that? Well, you really, the controlled traffic, right? So a lot of growers mm -hmm. now, you go to Australia and they actually put belt conveyors on the grain cart. 
because the combine auger can't be long enough to reach the grain cart if the grain cart is going to track in the same track as the combine did the last pass. And that's how serious they get about compaction. And one of the reasons I think they get that serious about compaction is because they're super moisture stressed. Like in those, those areas, you get to Western Australia, eight, nine, 10 inches of rain. They're still trying to grow wheat on that. And when you get compaction, you, you restrict that root growth. And if you can't get good roots and you can't get water into the plant, then, then you're really kind of cooked. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's the practical reality. We have, we have real challenges in Ontario with that because I have growers now who are talking about yield monitors touching 300 bushels per acre of corn, and it takes two grain buggies to keep up to one combine. And how do you always track in the same track? You know, do you have to go all the way to the far end of the field to turn around and come back in that same track? But we also have growers who, who are very cognizant. They're, they're the exception. They're not the general um, grower out there, but they, they will make sure that they run always to the back of the farm in that same track to, to avoid as much compaction as they can just just because of what marla talked about and and we see it all the time right mm -hmm. but but marla doesn't the fact we get such a hard frost d d doesn't that play into some of breaking up some of that compaction or am i talking about old wives tales again well no there is some level of frost that can actually break up compaction but Frost really only affects the top layer. It's not going deep. And so, yeah, we sometimes have like a deep freeze, but in order for frost to actually break up compaction, it needs to freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, like multiple effects. That doesn't happen to depth. That is only happening at that top surface. So the when we have compaction that goes deeper in the ground, it doesn't get broken up easily by frost. And what it does get broken up by more so, especially in our soil, say in Manitoba, where we have this shrink swell capability of the clays in our soils, is that the cracking that happens when the soil dries out is essentially like Mother Nature subsoiling your field because it's opening up that crack. And that's creating spaces now where water can move and roots can move again. Eventually those seal up again, again as the soil gets wet again. But what they found is that free or wetting and drying actually has more to do with breaking up compaction. And this is when we end up talking about compaction is when we go through wet fall after wet fall after wet fall, and we never actually get those drying conditions that would allow that uh, compaction to actually break up. Well, Mr. Bill uh, watching on YouTube, he says this sim very simply it's, you know, do no till and cover crops. I is it that simple, Marla? I would love it to be that simple. <laughs> if it was that simple, again, nobody would want to throw tomatoes at me. <laughs> you know, I mean, no-till is going to cut back on that plow pan, right, that we end up seeing and such, um, and things that have de developed over many, many years where you have that compaction layer. But even after 30 years of no-till, we can still find those plow pans in soil. So it doesn't just automatically go away. Um, you're decreasing some of the effect. But again, no-till still has tires and tracks going over it. And so it's not, you know, just because you're not tilling the soil, you're not fluffing it up and letting it sink back on itself and compact. But it still doesn't mean that you're taking away um, all travel. And cover crops can do great things in helping to aid some like extra root and such throughout the growing season. Yeah. One of the benefits you might see with cover crops could actually be an increase in uptake of water in the late fall. So if you had a cover crop growing when you're going through a wet period in the fall, that cover crop is taking out water and maybe that's going to dewater the field a bit so that maybe you're potentially at lesser risk of of compaction, but it, there's so many variables that become a part of it that we have, like, there's not just one sure thing you can do to get rid of it. Right. Like Pete, if you, if you are growing cover crops, that's great. And there's opportunities there for the root to, you know, to, to penetrate down and do some great things, but it, it's not like just because you have a cover crop doesn't mean you've eradicated uh, compaction off your farm. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, Sean, uh, to, to address Mr. Bill's comment, I am a no-till farmer 
And on, on a small scale, I admit I'm not, I'm not big acreage, but I'm a no-till farmer for the most part, as much as I can be. And I always use red clover, which is one of the best cover crops that we can use when I grow wheat. And by the way, in Western Canada, your, your season is short enough that it's much tougher to make cover crops work for you than it is here in Southwestern Ontario. Yep. But even though I'm no-till and I use cover crops, I still had to split tile after 30 years of, of doing what I thought were the right things, but I was still causing compaction. And so does it help? Sure. One of, the, one of my biggest complaints about no-till is that the conventional tillage farmers, they run till they're getting stuck and then they go do the custom work for the no-till farmer because that soil's firmer and <laughs> the combine rides up on top and they think, oh, I can keep running and, and we're mm -hmm. not doing any damage, right? Like, give me a break. If it's that wet that you're getting stuck in the conventional tillage, you're beating the no-till up to heck. But anyway, <laughs> it's hey, just life. Uh, you know, let's get to our second clip here because soil profile has it plays a big part here create the it's and it's not just the, the the different types of soils you have it's the characteristics of that soil we're going to watch a clip with curtis cavers he's with aafc porters la prairie and uh kara oosterhaus uh, is uh, hosting this interview as well so let's get to the next one because i know pete and marla both love a good soil pit so let's get to it here doing here today is we want to show a little bit about what soils people look for in terms of soil properties, uh, explain what uh, things are, are good or maybe challenging for crop production, and then show how that ties into growing crops in, in, in these various scenarios here. So what are we seeing here? Uh, this is one of the main soil types here at the uh, Carberry uh, uh, station here, Canada Manitoba Crop Diversification Centre. Uh, this is a, what is mapped as a ramata soil and uh, basically the, there's three main things that we're interested in uh, when we look at soils uh, from a classification standpoint. There's lots of sub details and things to get into as well but for, for a general overview we're concerned about what the soil texture is, what the natural internal drainage is of the soil and what the capability for dryland agriculture is. So there's two things based on properties and the third one's kind of a, a, a rating system for those properties. Uh, we're basically dealing with a soil that's uh, mostly clay loam in texture till you get down to a certain depth here and then it changes to sand. So we go from uh, a, a relatively medium or medium heavy soil texture to down at about three or four feet where it changes to fine sand. Um, so that's telling us that uh, as a medium soil, te uh, medium soil texture that uh, moisture holding capacity is good. It's actually fairly high, probably somewhere eight, nine, ten inches of available water in the top three feet. So when a crop's using, again a rule of thumb, if it's using a third of an inch of water per day, that means after a rain where we filled this profile up, uh, we've got, in theory, a, a month's worth of available water to grow a crop, which is really good. Internal drainage, uh, we can tell a lot about that based on the uh, types of horizons that are present. So we've got a nice black top uh, soil, A horizon, a nice deep brown B horizon of subsoil, and then our, our C horizon, our parent material. And uh, the other supporting thing that we use for figuring out uh, uh, internal drainages are uh, testing for carbonates. We do that with uh, hydrochloric acid. So when you add that to soil with no carbonates, it looks like just adding water. When you add it to an area that does have carbonates, you'll get that fizzing action there. So that's, that's all very nice and that, but the reason we do that is to know uh, where the carbonates are in the profile. If they were close or right at the surface, that's telling us we're getting very little downward movement of uh, of uh, carbonates because they are slightly soluble in water but because these are found at depth we know that they we've got good internal drainage through this so it's a well-drained soil medium textured soil so it holds lots of moisture but it doesn't hold moisture so that we've got excess moisture problems there's level slope no stones no um, no uh, salts or 
uh, compacted layers or anything like that. So basically we'd call this a class one soil. No restrictions for production agriculture under dry land situations. And it's actually also a pretty good soil for irrigating. So it's used for irrigated potatoes in this area. Uh, with with the high quality water it's a really good soil for irrigation as well so producers that are wanting to look and see what they have underground yeah how do mm -hmm. they do that if they don't have a giant hole well you don't have to dig a, a giant pit this is what we love just because we don't do it every day and yeah. i certainly wouldn't do this by hand no. but uh, to be able to run lots of people through large groups and show them what we're dealing with this is fantastic uh, education tool for that but you can learn a lot even with just digging a small hole with a shovel or going in and taking samples with a, an auger or a core or things like that. You'll see these things, it just won't be on the, in the big expanse of these things. So you'll still know what your depth of topsoil is, you'll still know how far down your roots go, you'll still know how far down carbonates or salts show up or anything like that. So you'll still get your horizon depths and all those things, it's just uh, looking at it in a more localized level. So. Okay, awesome. Anything else you'd like to add about what producers are asking here today or what you are showcasing? Well, we're showing the different crops here on top too and showing the different rooting depths. So that's trying to tie things in there as well. Not just what the soil properties are, but how do crops grow in a soil type like this? How would they grow differently if, if, if there were other soil properties at play, saying a high water table or salinity or something like that. Should this be tile drain? Should this be surface drain? Or should we be doing um, other things to conserve moisture on this? So there's lots of different things you look at and all those questions are gonna be, it depends uh, based on your soil type. And the best way to get an answer for that is to find out what soil type you're dealing with. Dig a hole. Doesn't have to be this big, but dig a hole. Uh, the hole doesn't have to be this big, but it needs to be. Uh, uh, <laughs> I like how Cur Curtis kind of has a bit of a disclaimer. Like, you know, I thought that was pretty funny. Good, good sense I, of uh, scientific humor. Marla, go ahead. Yeah. No, I also love the fact that it, the answer to everything is it depends. So, like, really, <laughs> <laughs> we can't make a decision to save our lives. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, so, as you look at, you know, if we could go out to our field, you know, dig a soil pit. Uh, like Curtis was standing in there, would it would we visually be able to see how bad compaction is, or do we need to do things like compression tests and things like that? Marla, me okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who's gonna take this one, Pete? Um, so uh, you can. There's, you know what? You don't have to dig a hole that big. And if you are in a heavy clay soil in the Red River Valley, nobody's going to want to dig any hole at all. But um, one of the things that I sometimes do, so lots of people say, oh, you know, Marla, I heard I could go buy one of those penetrometers for like 300 bucks. I should go buy one of those. You know, a penetrometer is only as good as the person using it. It's going to tell you where your soil is kind of tight, sure. And there are tricks to using a penetrometer to do it properly. A penetrometer also will just tell you when you hit dry soil, if your soil is drying out, because eventually it's not going to move. And so it's not necessarily uh, compaction. One of the things that I actually like to do, um, especially, well, first of all, I always say the best tool you can own is a shovel because the shovel is going to tell you if you've got a compaction problem. And if a farmer doesn't think he has a compaction problem, when I go out to the field, I give him the shovel and I have him dig the hole and he'll know pretty quick where that plow pan layer is and where the compaction is. Um, but if you have, if you're um, digging like with a post hole auger or something like that, like actually digging fence posts, putting fence posts in, you can use a knife and stick your hand down into the, uh, pen, uh, the hole at, put the knife into the soil profile facing you. You've got to do this kind of carefully so you don't end up cutting yourself. And then draw that knife back toward you carefully, of course, and you'll know where those layers are. Um, so you can actually feel those layers when you're kind of poking around in there because there's these tight spaces and you can go into a, a pit just like we were in with uh, Curtis and actually find where wheel tracks are, where there's like evidence of that track compaction um, down below. So shovel it's really your best friend yeah and yeah. you know pete uh what are you looking for like do you pay it like are you looking at uh for example organic matter so the idea that you know the more organic matter you have the less compaction you potentially have do you buy into those kinds of things 
Lord help us. Look at you, Sean. You're once again Sean the agronomist. This is this is most impressive. Holy snapping. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so does organic matter does it make a difference? And the answer is 100% yes, because what the organic matter really does is it, it acts as a spring in the soil so that you can, you can give a little compaction and it helps that soil tolerate that and spring back. But that's not the only thing that, that I look at. And I love Marla's use the shovel. Uh, way back when I first started as an agronomist, I went to Lambton County and Lambton County is heavy, heavy clay, 65% clay. And I, I, one of my first calls was out to a soybean field and they'd had a, a, a one inch pounding rain. And he, he wondered why his soybeans weren't coming up. And I said, well, let's dig them up and see. And I took my shovel and I went to get it in the soil and man, I had to jump on it to get it in the soil. And, and I went to dig out the, the soybean plants and I immediately snapped the handle on that shovel. So with a one inch rain, we had three inches of cement on the top of that heavy clay. Mm -hmm. No organic matter, too many soybeans in the rotation. So a whole bunch of things. So, so when you talk compaction, there's surface compaction, there's deep compaction. And the other thing that I really look at is look at the roots. So where Curtis was standing, and, and he didn't point this out in the video at all, but the horizontal compaction layers that you could see in that soil were horrendous. I, I'm yeah. screaming, Curtis, talk about that. Like, uh, anyway. I have pictures of that pit. I'll have to send you photos of that. I, I have pictures of that pit. Yeah. yeah. It, and and so, you know, the cover crops and, and the different root systems and but you, you want to see what you have for compaction, follow the roots down. Mm -hmm. And if you have deep mm -hmm. compaction, you'll get roots that are flattened out. If you have those horizontal compaction layers that Curtis had, the roots will go down and they'll hit that and they'll go sideways. So yeah. I, roots are really what, what I find yeah. the best indicator other than, than what we do when we bury sensors. So Marla, yeah. which, which crops have the best roots to do that kind of stuff? If you, if you want to use roots as a mitigation tool, what should I be thinking about planting? Oh man. So some crops are going to have maybe a slightly less risk of, of showing up the compaction. We might see it say with like wheat and canola or some crops that can sometimes move around in those tighter spaces. Um, one thing about canola, so it can put a fair bit of pressure down to push into the soils. But, you know, when we talk about cover crops, because we were talking about cover crops earlier, you have different um, covers like um, tillage radishes and stuff that people are, you know, purchasing for the purpose of breaking up compaction. And when they name them things like jackhammer and those other kind of fun sounding names, automatically you think, okay, this is going to be perfect. It's going to pound the way through the soil. It's going to break it all up for me. Um, but essentially, it's a taproot, and it's similar to canola. It's a brassica species. It's going to push down similarly to canola. Um, and so, you know, some of those crops might not show up in our soils having kind of the bad compaction issues, but we do end up seeing it sometimes occasionally in soybeans. Corn does not like having that compaction down below and roots growing on a plane, just like Pete said, it's where roots are growing in flat surfaces and not exploring the soil, you know, you've got a problem there. Well, Pete's always giving me a hard time about my lack of agronomic knowledge, but uh, I am, I am learning. I, I have a question for you, Marla. I, I read a story today about how you need to pay attention to your calcium versus your magnesium levels and how that relates to compaction. Can you clear this up for me? And is this even a thing? Okay. You're killing me here, Sean. Uh, okay. So you're, you're starting think, to sound like Pete. Yeah, yeah. It's like we're developing this thing now. I'm not sure if you're, I'm ever going to come back. Um, it's a good thing we're getting this over with early. Um, no, so magnesium... So magnesium can, if there's too much magnesium compared to calcium, it can play havoc in soil structure. So we often talk about calcium as being this big builder of soil structure. And it's beneficial when you've got clay soils because clays have a negative charge and what magnesium and calcium because they have two positive ions or like they're divalent cations. So they're positive charges, they can actually draw clays together. So they flocculate them or build soil structure at that very, very basic level. 
when you have too much magnesium compared to calcium, sometimes because the magnesium is a slightly smaller, it, it, it can just disrupt the general structure of that soil a little bit. And if you have, keyword being if, if you have really high magnesium compared to calcium, you may potentially have an issue. But I have never seen a high mag soil in Manitoba. Um, and I don't see that. And so I often will hear people talking about how, oh, those low lying areas that are saline or they, they get driven on all the time, they're also high mag. So therefore that's the problem. No, I've uh, never seen that as being a problem. We have high calcium because we have this limestone base to our soils. So it could maybe be an issue, but this is where I get a little frustrated when we use information that doesn't pertain to the regionality of our soils. So, you know, Peter can talk all about stuff that's going on in Ontario. It might be a very different scenario there because the soils in Ontario are different than the soils that are in Manitoba and the soils that are in Northern Alberta are different than the soils in Manitoba. So we do need to be really specific and understand the chemistry and the physical nature of our soils and how all these things work together. And it's going to change depending on where you are. Yeah, Pete, we, we face this all the time, you know, when, when you're on Real Ag Radio on Agronomic Monday and we're talking about all these issues and questions, the most important thing always is, that's a great question, but where do you farm? Because that mm -hmm. plays a huge role in the answer and, and the issues with compaction are no different, Pete. Yeah, absolutely. Where do you farm? Uh, if you're on a sand, you're not nearly as compaction prone. Uh, the magnesium thing, there are places in the world where that's real. But by the way, Marla, I haven't seen that in Ontario either. So okay. I'm, not very, I'm not very worried about that. Uh, you know, uh, we're not going to go out and, and add a whole bunch mm -hmm. of calcium to solve that. And the other thing is, you know, all you're going to solve is surface, even if you have that issue, because it takes time for the calcium to get deep. So, and lots of stuff going on from that perspective. But Okay. Well, it let the, it's time for our third clip. And Pete, you make an appearance in this one. This is you hosting a really good interview. Very interesting. Uh, it is with Dr. Matthias Stettler. He's in. He's with Bern University in Switzerland. So, Pete, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but he was at an innovative farming, innovative farmers field day in Ontario. What two years ago? Uh, be longer than that now, Sean. I, I'm not sure. Just. Uh, I'd have to think about that, but I think at least three years. It was called okay. Compaction Action, and it was what kickstarted it all. And and so, Matthias is the guru from Switzerland on on soil compaction, and they are they are way ahead of us on this issue. So some really cool stuff from him. Okay, mm -hmm. let's watch the clip. It is Dr. Matthias Stettler with Bern University. Here we go. So we put some uh, soil probes into the soil at different depths. We had the topsoil at 6 inches, upper subsoil at 12 inches, and then we had a third probe at 20 inches to measure subsoil compression and subsoil stress. So we drilled that into the soil, drove over with the machinery, and then we could directly read what happens in the soil with the stress. Uh, depending on the machinery we are driving over. Yeah, right on. And have you ever seen so many pieces of machinery at one day like this? It was impressive, right? I must admit, I've never seen that. I've made so many demonstrations in Europe, but here in Canada, you, yes. We, we set the record for you at least, yes, right? It's, it's very cool. We set the record here in Ontario from, a, from the, the different configurations. It was really cool. And so, you talk, we, we measured six inch level and that's good because that's surface compaction. We can take that out. What's the critical value? When, when they go to the website, they can look at this data. What's the critical value at the six inch level? So I would say do not um, have more than 15 PSI pressure on that level because then already you will have too much compression of this topsoil and you will have much uh, growth depression for the plants. Yep, and so 15, so when you're looking at that data, 15, just so give us a little bit as well. So if I continually do that, I'm, I'm running big equipment, you know, everybody wants to get bigger, I'm running this big equipment. What happens if I repeatedly go over 15 in that topsoil? Do I, how much do I hurt my you will, yield? You will lose yield approximately 5% each year. So it will go down, go down each year. It will maybe 
a bit less, five years and further, so we will up to we'll have up to 20% of yield loss at the end. So it will sum up. It so, will sum up. It, so, it, so even though we, we try to we try to rectify that, we're still seeing that. So 5% per year and a total of 20%. That's that's massive from and so really tells you that with with air pressure or with that surface compaction, getting that low tire pressure is really quite critical. Yes. Yeah. Inflation pressure is the most important thing if it comes to topsoil uh, prevention, uh, compaction prevention. So we really have to lower this inflation pressure as low as we can. Yeah. That's the most important thing. And, and so, yeah, that's 20% yield loss. So, so what about we also measured at the deep depth? And so this is this is a little more insidious. What's yield loss and what's the critical pressure when we get down to that 20-inch depth? So on subsoil, we usually speak of 7.5 psa as critical value. So we should not go further than this value, because we also have some uh, yield depression, not at massive as in the topsoil, but still. We can see if we have some singular uh, subsoil compression event, we lose permanently 3% of yield. Permanently. Each year you, you lose 3% of yield. Each year you lose 3% of yield. So again, massive in terms of when you look at what we're doing and, and these axle loads. So, so what surprised you the most today? I mean, we had combines loaded up that weighed 37 ton. We had manure tankers, the, the you know twin tanker, the 43 ton on the, fr on the lead tank and 37 on the back tank. What, what did you see here today that surprised you the most? The most surprising for me was the slurry tanker system of noon with this real, real big uh, implement tires were removed, I think, from 40 PSI down to 10, around yes. 10. Yes, yeah, the rubber railroad. Yes, this rubber railroad was so impressive for me and we could see, we could lower that pressure in the soil absolutely to a minimum. So it was really great to see that, that we have a, such a big effect of tire inflation pressure with very big tire volume. Yeah, and so it's really cool and you have to go look at this stuff on the website because what we did, as, as Matthias said, we ran that rubber railroad at 40 psi, lots of compaction, but 43 ton, come on, and then dropped it to 10 psi, which the tire manufacturer, it's good for that. We have three big tires there. And then we got that compaction way down low. And the next thing we did was run the pickup truck. And what happened with the pickup truck? Oh, well, this pickup truck didn't perform much better than this big trailer, <laughs> even on the topsoil was even It was worse, worse actually. Was worse, the pickup yeah. trucks, how many guys do not drive a pickup truck through the field, load it up with something, and we got surface compaction right through the roof. Really, yeah. really yeah. intriguing yeah, stuff. That was also impressive for me. I yeah. didn't think of that. Yeah, so, so, so what about the other big question? So we did a bit of, of tires versus tracks. What, what do you expect to see there, and, and did that play out today? Well, we, we compared this Tiger tractors, one the Quad and one with the wheels, and we have seen the Quad tractor is much heavier than the wheeled one. And there is not that much difference between wheels and tracks, so it was double wheels. Yes. And if we have double wheels at low pressure, it's not that much worse than the track version. So that was also impressive for me to see that in the reality in the field. Yeah, and so that was a very cool thing. I think you need to look at as well, the, the Steiger tractor, if you took the wheels off or you took the tracks off and you weighed those two units, they weighed the same. But we put the wheels on, it only weighed 18 and a half ton and at low pressure with duels all the way around, we could get it quite low. Once we put the tracks on, it added six and a half tons of weight. We're now up to 25 tons. We need that to get traction on the quad track. And, and it was good for compaction, but not much better than the wheeled version. So that was... These tracks are heavy and the problem is they put the tracks on very heavy machinery. So if you look at combines, if you look at other machinery where they put tracks, we, we measured wheel loads of up to 14 tons on one track. So, well, tracks are good, but if you have such high wheel loads, the subsoil will be compacted anyway. Yep, and that was the other really interesting thing. When we went to low pressure, we could really alleviate the, co the, the compaction in the surface zone, and it would drop down and be comparable to tracks, or the tracks might still be better, but when we went to that deep compaction, right, that 20-inch compaction, they, the tracks and the tires were just very similar, right? Yes. Maybe not exactly yes. the same, but very, very similar. So, so really cool stuff. So on that deep compaction, the one note that really hits me is we have all this tile drainage. 
And we've been having to split tiles, right? So we put pipe in the ground to take the excess water away. We've been having to split that tile. Well, I think it's this deep compaction. So below 12 inches, we get that compaction. Once we get that compaction, going to impede water movement, correct? Okay. Like you're the soils guy. Water cannot move anymore. So you need, you need to tile more frequently. That's, that's the answer. Good, great stuff. Pete, good job as a host. That was pretty good. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed. You, you, we'll turn you into a host yet. Yeah, I got, I got to ramp it down just a tad. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, you're supposed to let the guests talk. That's one of the big, that's one of the big things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Pete, okay, so I, I want to talk about tile because you, you hit on at the end there. Where does tile fit in as a solution here on compaction? So tile dries out the soil. Like it, it takes away the excess moisture. And if there's not excess moisture, as Marla said right at the very beginning, stay off the soil when it's wet. So does tile help from that perspective? Absolutely huge. However, it's not the whole answer because you still in between the tile is going to be wetter than, than over the tile and you drive on that field, you're still going to get that deep compaction. And tile drainage helps but it only helps so far and we we need the low pressure tires and we haven't talked about tire technology at all yet sean that has come so far in the last little while i really think that and and then controlling that that tire inflation as well right so yeah so tile drainage is a huge plus from a compaction standpoint because it removes the excess water but but that's where it stops it's still it's management after the tile drainage that then becomes important Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marla, Pete and I, we last week on Real Ag Radio, him and I had a big, a whole segment dedicated to cent, uh, center tire inflation system or central tire inflation systems. Yep. Um, very, very common in Europe. And I think when Pete says, you know, Europe's a little bit ahead of us in some of these things, this would be one of those examples, being able to adjust your tire pressure based on you know, your field conditions or whether you're on the road or not. Uh, I, I really hope this is something we see more of here in North America. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's expensive technology to look at adopting, but man, could it be beneficial in the long run? Because we're really talking about situations here where we need to be able to change tire pressure as we go, because your rated pressure for when you're traveling on the road is not the rated pressure for what you want to be traveling in the field with. And so that ability to change that tire pressure as you go could have big benefits, I think, in the long run. Marla, what about uh, tillage at different depths? Is, is that important to be changing what depth you're, if you are doing tillage? I know, Pete, tillage is a swear word, but Marla, some people do have to till once in a while. Uh, what about changing your depth? I used to run a zero till farm, so I'm with you on that. And now I work a lot in the Red River Valley, so I got to be careful what I say about no till. Um, so, uh, yeah, one of the reasons why I've been talking a lot about strategic tillage with farmers when I'm talking, and this just this goes beyond just compaction. It's looking at all aspects of kind of soil health and where tillage fits into it or doesn't. And one of the things that we've seen is situations where you have farmers using that same piece of equipment at the same depth over and over and over again that causes a plow pan or a compaction layer. We, that's where our plow pans came from in the first place is consistent plowing at that six inch depth to cause that layer down below. But we are seeing situations where we have farmers running high speed shallow discs at two inches and causing compaction at two inches because that's the only piece of equipment they're now using is this high speed shallow disc. And we talked a little bit about this idea earlier of feeling like, oh, this makes us feel better about what we're doing. We don't yes. think it's that bad. We feel better about vertical tillage and high speed shallow discs because we're only going this deep, right? Right. We can't be doing that much damage because we're only doing it to this surface, but we're doing a lot of damage <laughs> at this depth. And we're potentially, and we have now seen some fields where after multiple years of use of the equipment, we're getting a new plow pan at two inches. I don't want to see that. Yeah. That worries me. So if you're going to be using tillage, thinking about rotating the type of implement you use, as well as the depth that you're using it and targeting that tillage to the crop residue that you're dealing with and the crop that's going to get planted into that field next year. 
So you're looking at your crop rotation and you're deciding where tillage fits in and what type of tillage fits in to that rotation. And that's what I talk about in terms of being strategic with your tillage. Okay. Uh, Pete, I'm going to make you talk about tillage and you may get itchy, but I'm going to make you do it anyway. Uh, John Kowalczyk, a farmer from Alberta, has a question here. Um, did you talk yet about deep tillage? Does that help with breaking up that hard pen? I know when we go to Agritechnic every year, you know, in Europe, there you'll see like a, 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 you know, a deep, deep plow that's like almost taller than me and I'm six feet tall. Pete, uh, is, is something like that the answer to break up that hard pen? Oh yeah. So I am not a deep tillage guy, full stop. <laughs> but the problem is, and if, if we're going to run this big equipment and we're going to compact the soil at depth, then the only way you can correct that, as Marla said, if you get the wet dry clays, they can, they can help with that, but not all soils are clays mm -hmm. that shrink and swell. Yeah. And so either you go to a, a crop like alfalfa that's in that field for a number of years to give the root it's enough to actually do the jackhammer and, and break up that deep compaction. Or when it's dry, you go out there and you do some deep tillage. The problem with the deep tillage is that if your next pass over the field is with heavy equipment when it's wet, all you've done is drive that deep till or that deep compaction even deeper and made it worse. So you have to have a crop growing. You want to do deep tillage, you do it you know, when your cover crop is growing and there's enough time that those roots can go down and stabilize what you've loosened up so that it can't recompact. Can deep tillage help? Absolutely. But if, if you're doing deep tillage every year to correct compaction, I guarantee all you're doing is driving it deeper and making the problem worse. It's interesting. It's like one of those where you think you're solving the problem, but you're potentially, it's like one step forward, two steps back kind of thing, Marla. Yeah, well, and I'm glad that you mentioned it needs to be dry because it needs to be dry enough to till. But the thing with deep tillage, if you're going and doing subsoiling and such, is it dry enough at depth? Because sometimes it might be dry at the surface and it might still have moisture at depth. And then you don't end up getting that shattering effect that that type of tillage is supposed to be able to break up and kind of shatter the soil. And instead, you just end up smearing down below. So again, it's really about knowing that you've got the right conditions to the depth of tillage and, and that it's dry to depth to make that happen. Good comment. Kara uh, yeah. asks, what part do animals play in compaction? For example, grazing ground. I'm thinking about people, you know, they're doing all this kind of cool regenerative stuff and livestock plays a part. We let animals out there and uh, cattle make tracks and uh, that's got to play a part in compaction, Marla. Yeah, cattle make tracks, they pug, they cause all sorts of little compaction spaces and spots in the soil. I think one of the things though, depending on how you're managing your grazing, if you're managing your grazing really well and you have a really good kind of uh, forage base, you've got that root in there. And Pete was talking about those roots too as being important um, for drying that soil out, but also they help to kind of hold some structure to the soil as well. So they can be beneficial then um, so in that system where you're grazing grasses, that hopefully the roots are kind of counteracting any compaction from the cattle. But that being said, they're going to move around, they're going to ca cause those paths, they're going to create their own little tracks in the field too. And, and that becomes just part of that system. Pete, that's what you yeah, need the, is cattle. Yeah, the, the axle load on cattle is not very heavy. So they're not causing yeah. deep compaction. It's yeah. just surface compaction. Surface. And and yeah, that's what I need is cattle. Oh, Lord, help us. You know, Sean, that in Ontario now, there are no fences for like 500 miles. And if ever the cattle get out, oh, uh, yeah, I don't ride horse enough to, to chase them, man. It just ain't happening. Pete on a horse, where, how do we make that happen? That That's like one of those things. Uh, good. Another, you know, Long-term thinking here. Kara makes another good point. Can you talk about how, how long into the future your decisions you make this year impact you down the line when it comes to compaction? So this year across the prairies, Marla, it is, it's quite dry right now. We don't have a, a lot mm. of reserve moisture. Um, P, 
Pete, uh, we were getting rain in Ontario. It doesn't feel like, you know, it, it didn't feel like that in June, July, but we're getting it now. So how, how do those decisions now impact how, like how far does that go into the future? That's probably the best way to put it. So I think Matthias had some of the best data from a deep compaction standpoint, that 3% yield loss and, and the data says it never goes away. So even one compaction event, just one compaction event and 12 years out, they still measured a 3% yield loss from that deep compaction. And the question then becomes, so if you deep compact every year, you know, where does that, that, level of yield loss go to. How long does it impact you? It impacts you for a long time. The surface compaction we can do something about, but if you make the decision, because sometimes you have to, it, it's wet in the fall and you have to get the crop out because, you know, leaving canola out over winter in the Peace River District of Alberta does not generally bode well for the yield next spring. Yeah, yeah though, that has long-term impacts. There's just no question about it. George says pinch row and headland yield data will turn heads. Marla, can you comment on the yield loss? You know, uh, I wish I could say more about that we see about yield loss. I know that um, colleagues to the south in Minnesota with us looking at corn, they found like 17% yield loss in, in tracks, uh, like real tracks for where corn was planted later on across uh, compared to the rest of the field. And so if you look at that 17%, that's significant in that area. But when you spread that across the entire field, then all of a sudden it doesn't look like it's a, that big of a yield loss, right? And so that's my question too with the 3%, is that 3% in that one space or is it 3% once you've averaged it across the whole yield because, or across the whole field? Because it, there's a lot of differences in how you can report it. One thing that I wish I had more of was data on yield loss. Because quite often when we look at data and so, yield loss, uh, we're going and... Oh, just finish, Marla. I'm breaking up. Okay. So when we're looking at data and yield loss, we end up seeing issues where, you know, we're looking at last year's wheel track, but are we really able to have a good idea of what's happening across the field compared to just that one little wheel track that we might be uh, testing in? Pete? So, so yeah, Ohio State's done some really great work there in terms of how much of the field do you track and, yeah. and you don't think you're, you're tracking that much of it, but actually, uh, yeah. the, you know, the grain buggy and the combine between those two, if, if they don't run in the same pack, you're compacting about a third of the field, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even as much as 40% of the field. So you say, well, 3%, it's only in the track. But yeah, that's 40% of the field that is actually in the track. And that's one compaction event. We compact it every year and it's rarely in the same track that we compact. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so and, and George's comment about pinch rows, man, some of these corn planters that have the, the central fill tank. So all the weight is on the center section and the pinch rows that were the, that were the, the corn grows between the two tires on the planter. They've measured tremendous yield losses, 30 or 40 or 50 bushels per acre sometimes if they're planting when it's a, a bit tough because you've compacted on each side of that center row and, and it, it can't grow, grow roots either way. Uh, where you're outside of the pinch rows, then at least it can grow one way. But in the yeah. pinch row, that, that's huge. And Marla said, corn does not like compaction. We had lots of issues this spring in Manitoba because we had such wet soil conditions last fall and then going into spring still with that. We had sidewall compaction um, where seeds were getting kind of smeared into the side and that sidewall, same thing, similar to you'd see in a pinch row, except it was with every row um, where you'd have problems with emergence because once that, that crop would actually get going, the roots basically stopped because they had very little ability to kind of push through that compaction. So compaction happens in so many different ways in the field. Mm. Crazy yeah. stuff. And that grain Lots of hatchet roots, eh? Yeah, well, that, that grain buggy's just zipping all over the place. 
Like there, there's no rhyme or reason sometimes to that thing. It, it's all, it's all over the place. So, and and if we hear what Matthias talked about in terms of you know tire pressure and tracks versus treads, why do, if if tracks are that much better, what why do we see tires on 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 anything? Is is it a cost thing or what's the what's your thoughts there, Pete? Yeah. So first off, whoa, stop. Tracks are not that much better. In fact, tires can be every bit as good as tracks okay. if you have them at the right pressure. If you go to a VF tire, so now we have this new tire technology, IF, which means intermediate flexibility on the sidewall, VF, with, which means very flexible sidewall, and it allows the tire to lengthen its footprint. So we get the big footprint and it, it's not a wider footprint. Everybody thinks, oh, well, the, the bags on the side, it's, mm-hmm. it's a wider footprint. No, no, it's a longer footprint. That's, that's the difference. And the problem with tracks, number one, they add a lot of weight. And number two, they are far more uh, trouble in terms of wear and tear. And, and you have to, to uh, more maintenance. Yeah, they're tougher to go at speed down the road because of how they, they work. And so, yeah, uh, t- tracks are good, but they are not better than tires. The, where tracks really win is because I can make that track super long. And so if mm-hmm. I need to make that track 12 feet long, just so I can run my 2000 bushel grain buggy, I can make the track 12 feet long. It's hard to build a tire that will lengthen out to 12 feet, right? You need a that's very a big high tire. diameter tire. Yeah, that's, that's a, a big, big tire. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That, that's like out in Sparwood, BC, where they have the world's largest uh, truck. You need that kind of tire where it's like, mm. it's uh, you can fit yeah. three Greyhound buses in the back of it. Uh, question here from 69 Druth. Does heavy rollers compact greatly or no? So if he's talking about a drum roller, right? Where we're rolling after we plant soybeans to facilitate harvest. Or pulses, yep. Yeah, pulses, whatever. Like, so, so we're really trying to get it so that it's flat and the combine can do an excellent job of, of scraping the ground. Do they compact? Yeah, they absolutely do. Because if you, if you roll the ground, and I mean, we do this all the time in Ontario, you roll it and you get that one inch thunderstorm, man, those beans, they will just fight uh, well if it's edible beans you just go replant because you just know they're going to struggle so much you just go replant if you didn't roll it then they emerge much better because that you haven't find that soil up and made it prone to compaction Mm -hmm. from that that raindrop but there's a reason we roll and that's to facilitate harvest it just it's a trade-off Marla, yeah. you get you get the last word here. What 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 are some of the final thoughts that people should be left with when it comes to compaction? Oh man, I, I think the big thing um, that I often think about again, like I say the word deliberate, but really when we were talking about managing for compaction, it's about planning and thinking and building soil structure through good soil management practices. Because like Pete talked about earlier having higher organic matter, building that full structure, the fact that, you know, the rollers are partly compacting, but also damaging soil structure at the surface, which is causing some of that issue. And so everything that we can do to build structure can help our soils withstand that impact of compaction in the future. And so it really is about long-term planning. There aren't short-term solutions really, other than dealing with the tires and, and dealing with that type of issue. There's not a lot of short-term things. We really do We need, want to think a bit about that long-term management strategy. Well, hey, gr- great stuff, gang. This has been a lot of fun. We've been uh, broadcasting here for 65 minutes. So uh, compa- some great questions and comments from the audience. And uh, clearly compaction is something that is really on the minds of growers from coast to coast. Uh, people realize that there is some yield robbing happening. Maybe not as much as, it's probably more than they actually think. Uh, but solutions, uh, you need to work at it. There's that, I think that's one of the challenges here, and Marla and Pete both uh, mentioned this, is, is there's no one silver bullet. It, it's like having a system 
in place and taking care, you know, taking care of as many variables as you possibly can. You know, we watched three great clips today. If you do want to see more footage like this or or even more, you can go to cropschools.com or just go to realagriculture.com and click on the crops tab. And we've got a whole vault, a library of agronomic content. That's one of the goals here of our agronomist episodes to, to sort of bring some of that out and make sure we get in front of you and we can discuss it and talk about it. So great, great fun here doing real ag in prime time. Marla, thanks a lot for joining us here today. Yeah, thanks, Sean. It was a lot of fun. Hey, Pete, always great to chat with you. And we'll, like I said, we'll make you into a host yet. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I tried to let Marla talk tonight. I really did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. I, I, honestly, I, I appreciate yeah, both of you. Great, great insight on this very, very important topic. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for getting real and getting connected with our new show, The Agronomist. And we'll see you again next week. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>